Hey, it's your host, Brittany, and welcome to the Mom Sweat Sanity Podcast, where we talk all things life, health, fitness, kids, relationships, you name it, nothing is off the table. A little bit of just me and a whole lot of knowledgeable guests. So throw on your Lulus to run or to mom, grab yourself a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, and join us as we unpack life's pressing topics and learn a little bit more of the who, what, whys of it all. Or at the very least, get real, share some wisdom, and grab practical tips to help in our daily lives. I was reading reading going, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Over and over and over and over again. Cause I never thought that my beloved breast would be making me sick. No. So yeah, totally. But then it was, I couldn't stop it from coming at me. And then that was January 4th and I had them out February 3rd. So oh my God. It was like, wow. I didn't yeah. have enough time to even really worry. Like, what am I going to look like after? Like, no, it was get rid of them. Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in today. Today I am here with Shelby Kennedy. Yes, the same Shelby that you heard from a few weeks back. But today she is here on a completely different topic. Today, Shelby is bringing some advocacy to the world of breast implant illness, BII, otherwise known as. Shelby is going to unpack this, tell us all about her symptoms and her healings and recovery post-operation. This is something that I have heard more and more of over the past, I'm going to say year, but it is also something that I have no knowledge in. I have never had breast implants. However, I do have to say that it was something that was in my considerations at one point after having nursed three children. So I'm just really interested in this topic, especially as I said, with hearing about it more and more. So Here is Shelby. Let's just dive in today and listen to her story. Just as a quick side note, sorry for some of the audio. Shelby is coming through to us via satellite, and so sometimes it glitches a little bit, but I hope that you still enjoy every single minute. Thanks so much. Shelby is here, and she is diving into all things breast implants. (laughs) We are back. (laughs) Okay, sounds good. I'm into it. Awesome. So Shelbs, how old were you when you first got your implants? And what was your rationale then around the decision of wanting implants in the first place? Uh, Okay, well, I was 24 when I had them. So if anyone listened to my other podcast, it was regarding my divorce and moving on and trying to find myself. Now, I hope that I highlighted that, that that was not an easy journey. After I left my husband, I met someone that I believed I was madly in love with, and it ended up becoming physically abusive. And so that was sort of part of the tailspin that is, it was my failed marriage. It was trying to deal with that. It was feeling less than beautiful, attractive. I felt like the mental part that comes with being in an abusive relationship There's so many feelings involved with that, and they haunted me for many, many, many years. And I believe that if only I was prettier, if only my boobs were bigger, if only I looked a certain way and did a certain thing, and then he he wouldn't have done that to me. And we would have been in love and lived happily fucking ever after, and all of that just really isn't true. So from the deepest, darkest depths is where I got my idea. Looking for the recognition from outside instead of inside. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's part of that journey. And obviously we have to go through what we go through to get to where we have to go. But hindsight's 2020 and that they ended up making me sick. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, it didn't come from a great place and bad things happened, but you know, we just have to just go for it instead. But yes, I had an abusive relationship that left me feeling at an all time low. And I opted to have them thinking that an upgrade would make me these more desirable, more attractive, all these things that I thought I needed to be because he felt me, made me feel like I wasn't those things. Mm-hmm. That would be the trigger. And I was 24. Wow. When I got yeah. them put in. So 24. Yeah. And did you ever have any increases throughout the time or was it that one, that one experience of implant and then you had them through until you started to feel different signs and symptoms of illness? I had them for 
Well, that was my first set. I had a second set put in in 2017. And then I got in increasingly sick, which I'll, I'll go over all that. But and then I had them removed last year um, in February of 2020. So eight years, eight years of suffering for sure. It took me a long time to make the connection between my breast implants and my illness, my reoccurring, never ending illnesses. Was the illness pretty quick? Like now that you look back at it, were there signs and symptoms there from almost day one of having breast implants? It took four months, nearly to the day. Wow. It started with, it started with horrible, painful ovarian cysts. And I thought, you know, some people get those like woman thing, no big deal. But then as it kept getting repeated and repeated and I opted not to go, I had ultrasounds and opted not to go in and have them removed because, you know, who wants to go to surgery if they don't have to. And then they say, well, your body will probably just rupture them and reabsorb them, which is obviously a more painful route, but it avoids being cut open. And so that was the very beginning of my journey with prescription painkillers, which ended up being a long one, but that was, it took four months to start going on drugs, not being able to cope, acne, cystic acne all over my chin, like depression and gut problems. Anything I eat upset my stomach. I'd be bloated all the time, even though I literally ate next to nothing. So then it started to begin with this struggle, I would say, with eating, because it's like, you eat something, you feel like crap, you don't eat something, you kind of still think like, uh, it was never knowing what was going on and never being able to identify uh, if there was a particular food doing it, because it wasn't. But so were you looking yeah. for, you, you were going down paths looking for like everything else as to what was causing this and nothing was coming back? Like you, you never thought that this was something that was coming from the implants or was it a, maybe a, a vague thought or, you know, gut feeling, so to say, was it ever there? I think this is the, the right time to start from the beginning. Okay. okay. So let's go for it. 2012, 2012, I get my breast implants. About four months later, you got the ovarian cysts, cystic acne, depression, gut problems, constantly constipated, TMI, but it's part of it. So in 2013, I meet the love of my life, which is my husband, and we decided, okay, we want to have a baby. So we're super thrilled. I end up getting pregnant, but the pregnancy was in my left fallopian tube. So, which is horrendous pain, obviously, over pregnancy growing in the incorrect organ, essentially. It's not made to stretch. It's not the uterus. So I had to have emergency surgery to remove the pregnancy. And then once I woke back up, the OBGYN let me know that I was full of endometriosis. Okay. Now, endometriosis is a disease where the tissue starts growing outside of the uterus. Okay. So when you get your when your body is going on a cycle, you feel like the li uterine lining fills up, right? It gets, it's prepping for pregnancy. The uterine lining gets nice and full and ready. If you don't get pregnant, it sheds and that's what your period is, right? Mm -hmm. So every time you have these bigger hormonal spikes, spikes, which is all triggered by estrogen, you're getting a buildup of more diseased tissue. So it was all over my uterus, all over my ovaries, all over my fallopian tubes, which had them all knotted up and scarred into what they call, I'll never forget this quote my whole life. They look like a labyrinth. So that was difficult to hear. It was like speaking Spanish. I'd never heard the word endometriosis before. And she goes to tell me, okay, it's disease tissue. The likelihood of you being able to get pregnant naturally is going to be quite low. So we re recommend doing IVF. So, you know, we were kind of rocked. I had no idea what was going on, but we're like, okay, we don't want to waste any time. We just lost pregnancy. Like, right, let's do it. So once I was healed, I went through the IVF process, and then we were, were so grateful to have the most wonderful, beautiful daughter that we have, Miss Mackenzie, who's now five years old. During my pregnancy, I felt pretty darn good. They say when your body is pregnant, the way your hormone levels, they work differently. I guess you kind of remain static, um, and that actually can suppress or just pause your, the growth of your endometriosis. But then they say once you you know, have your baby and you're no longer pregnant, it fires right back up again. 
you're kind of back where you were. So you, you can get a bit of solace from a little bit of a pause for some. And then, so after we had Mackenzie, I felt like I was doing okay. I was dealing with some crippling anxiety though. And the doctor told me I had postpartum depression and anxiety, which is really common. And so I was ready to, I was ready to accept that. That was okay. But I was having trouble standing. I was back to where I was before having trouble standing up straight because I was in so much pain, really sore hips and back. And then, so now here I go, I'm back on painkillers again. So more visits to the doctors trying to figure out how to manage my pain. I stopped eating dairy because I was thinking that dairy was creating all my gut problems, spending as much time in bed as possible while still trying to be a good mother, which which then takes that. a side onto your mental health, having to deal uh, with oh. all that also. And then the mom shame and the mom guilt and all of that. Absolutely. But, but I was just like, I just, yeah, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I just can't get out of bed. And it was the body and it was the mind and the heart and the soul and the exhaustion and chronic pain is really starts to kind of eat away at your soul. So about seven months after Mackenzie was born, we used our last embryo that was in cryogenics with, uh, and did IVF to have another baby. I miscarried that pregnancy. That was our last chance to have a baby unless we wanted to go through the whole IVF process again. I was feeling really poorly all the time, tired and understandably reeling from my losses and, you know, kind of wrapping back around to like my personal self-loathing, not being able to give my husband more children and feeling crappy all the time, you know, not really being like a productive member of my marriage and being that person that's sick all the time. But guess what? I feel like crap. Yeah, we know. I always felt like crap, but then you got the guilt about feeling like crap. So it's a difficult place to live in that. So after my miscarriage, my OBGYN thought it was a good idea to remove my other fallopian tube because once you have one ectopic pregnancy, it becomes more likely that you would have another. And we already knew that my fallopian tubes were labyrinthy. So the chance of the sperm and the egg meeting and then making their six day travels down to the uterus was slim to none at this point. So I made my appointment and I was on the wait list. Then I became pregnant, which we were over the moon, untouchable. But then the horrendous pain began. So we found out that it was another eptopic pregnancy and that pregnancy was growing in my one remaining fallopian tube. So at this point, devastating, but we knew the drill back to emergency surgery. They removed my remaining fallopian tube and the pregnancy. That was it though. That means... There was no chance of getting pregnant naturally because I no longer have the pathway for my eggs to come down and meet my uterus. At that point, I started seeing a psychologist, which I had been on and off, but now I was back on trying to deal. So in 2017, I was still battling depression and fatigue, still not eating dairy, which is difficult, like on top of feeling exhausted. Now you're trying to regulate everything you eat. So I just think to myself, this must be what it's like to get older. You know, I've just got a bad, pulled a bad couple of cards. You're just sad because of your body and all you've been through. Still going to the gym regularly, pushing through, feeling like crap. I felt like it was my only salvation, a little bit of a reprise if I could get myself out of my truck and into the gym. So more constant gut pain and decided to go vegan, gluten-free and processed food-free I felt like it helped for around six months. And then the stabbing gut pain was back. Some days I dropped my daughter off at preschool and just go back home and get into bed, which not really all that proud of that. But sometimes you just, you just have to do what you need to do in order to get through the day. Absolutely. I feel like when I talk about it now, the way I feel now in comparison, I feel so different that like, I, I don't remember that person that would lie in bed all day. It's almost bizarre. Like I feel a bit of a disconnect between the person I'm talking about and the person I feel like I am today. So the hip and the back pain and the acne and the depression, all still there with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. So this is 2017. And then one morning I, I woke up and my left breast was huge. It was very strange and a little bit alarming. I went through the proper channels and the doctors and then found out that I had a late stage seroma, which means... We figure, the doctors figure after an ultrasound and a big needle inserted into the fluid into my breast and then tested, we figured that that my breast may have been jarred from some sort of a trauma. And then it basically would detach 
from the scar tissue pocket that's around and then you'd have a space and then your body immediately fills it with fluid so it was like ebb and flow sometimes my breasts would be huge and then it would be back to normal and then it would be huge again and then back to normal so we had the fluid tested for breast implant associated cancers which was the first time I'd ever heard that what do you mean breast implant associated cancers so now I'm like okay well interesting so they're like oh good news it's negative for cancer so then you think okay I don't have cancer so that's great we're through the worst so with my own personal reasons and my own struggles and challenges I had two choices one would be to remove my breast implants and go without and the second would be to replace them and I chose to replace them unfortunately but So I had them replaced in 2017. I healed up well. I thought no more about it because if it wasn't cancer, then I don't have to worry. I also wanted to mention that the implants that I had put in were textured. Now, textured breast implants were recalled, but of course they were recalled a year before I had mine removed. With recalled breast implants, they pay because it's a faulty product, they pay to have your removal and so on and so forth. But I didn't know about breast implant illness and all the communication and all the dialogue behind it. So I just paid to have them replaced, which yeah, Yeah. a lot of money. Everyone knows it has breast implants, knows that it's not a small chunk of change. So sorry, backing up a little bit, Chubbs. So going into it, you said you were shocked about hearing about the breast implant cancer potentials and all this, like signing your forms and whatever, like do doctors actually sit with you and let you know of like all of the, the concerns and things that are associated with this, or is this because it's a business essentially something that, okay, sign, sign here and let's move along. He had said breast implant associated cancers. We have to test your fluids. So we have to stick a big needle in your boob. So there was a little bit of conversation behind that. They basically said textured implants, gummy bear. Some of these terms that you hear were really all the rage when I had them done a few years before, right? Even my my best friend had them, whatever. They were all the rage. So, but they're saying now there's been data that we've seen that the textured implants in particular due to the, because they physically have like, instead of you'll hear smooth and textured, it's the the outside of the implant Mm -hmm. and what they're supposed to do or what they're not doing is correctly your body's not healing correctly around them and keeping them secured on your chest wall or some such business. And and it's funny because I'm still not even that clear on it. And I had them, but when you sign your new forms, it was the same thing. Like infections are common after surgery. That's not our fault. That kind of thing. You need to take care of yourself, so on and so forth, things to look for, but there was no like, so breast implants, can make people really sick with autoimmune, neurological, and mental and physical depression. There was none of that. It was just your standard form that you get from when you have a surgery that says you can get infected, you know, take care of yourself, clean your wound, whatever. Keep your tape on for this amount of days. So now this this was 2017 though, right? And, And there's been more dialogue and more people coming forward a lot more since then but in 20 we're going to skip ahead to 2018 that was summer of 2017 when I had them replaced so they healed up well and it wasn't cancer so we were good I'm back at the gym I'm managing my stomach pain by cycling Tylenol T3s and prescription opioids in fear that I was going to become addicted the pain was terrible and seemed to not be affected by my eating habits so at that point I'm pretty much like lost cause I brought meat back into my diet, but I kept the dairy out. Then summer came, excuse me, and I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. My OBGYN recommended a hysterectomy. After a lot of crying and going back and forth, my husband and I decided that I needed to do it. I was 31 years old. I felt like I had to sacrifice my last chance to have another baby, to carry another child in the chance that I could feel better. I couldn't be the mother and the wife that my husband and daughter deserved if I was always chronically ill. So oh my gosh, I, the emotional level of that just in itself is just incredible. 
well, I mean, that was a couple of years ago and I still want to be upset about it. You know, we can't put things in a small box and lock them in the back of our brain as much as I, you know, do go see people. And I hope that, you know, I do deal. Those were still very serious losses that I had to suffer. And it's still a little bit sad. Yeah, it's sad. As it should be. And as you should be allowed to express that. That's definitely a loss that obviously I can see that you're, I want to say dealing with, but that's totally not the right word to say, because I feel like that's something that's just always going to be there. It will always be there. You know, as much as I want to be sad and angry and blame somebody and pour me in the whole deal, like I still have a beautiful five-year-old daughter that is the light of my life. And I'm so, I'm so proud to be her mother. But yeah, when you, and you have your health now as, as these years have taught you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you don't have that. You don't have anything. It's true. When you have your choice taken away from you, it feels different. Making a choice not to have more children is not the same as no longer having the reproductive system to do so. Yeah. So it has its own, this is its own thing on top of, but yeah. So we're we're making our way through the year now and (laughs) we're kind of getting to the point where we're getting closer to making the connection when I had my hysterectomy um, they removed my uterus and my cervix they also found endometriosis on my bladder and my bowels which has a lot to do with why I peed so much why I always had gut pain why I always had difficult pain going to the bathroom and I could never hold it oh it's just on and on, but you know what? I did, I did start to feel better. Okay. So that was amazing. I hurt less and I was able to stop taking prescription painkillers, which was always a huge battle for me because I never envisioned myself as a person that took drugs all the time. And then you think back and you're like, okay, well, you're taking drugs and driving. It's not a good scene. I, well, you did what you had to do to get through that that pain. Yeah. And I was taking more than I would ever say to anyone. I, I could I could not admit how many I was taking. It makes me feel ill. I actually don't know how I got through all those years without being addicted to them. Like, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So let's skip ahead to 2019. So things are going well. I have a little stomach pain, but nothing serious compared to what I was I was experiencing before as a cakewalk. It's like whatever, I can handle this. So still battling cystic acne and the sneaking feeling that I was depressed. So after all these traumatic events, I kind of always just equated it to your body. Look what you suffered. You don't have depression. You're just sad. Like, look what you've been through. It's reasonable. And, and that was sort of my, my justification towards how I felt mentally. Also, there's this own stigma around depression and, you know, you have a happy life. Like, you know, you're not living on the street. You have money. You have a daughter. Like, you know, why? Whatever. So I never really wanted to walk that that road, I kind of just said, it makes sense from what I've been through for me to be sad. That's okay. Right. That was okay. Mm -hmm. In February of 2019, I had unexplained random bruising all over my legs. And I don't mean like, oh, I walked into the bed frame and got a bruise, like random tons of bruises all over my legs. And I'm not a bruiser. Like I have to be hit quite hard in order to actually have a bruise. So I was a bit freaked out. I thought maybe I was low on iron, uh, which would make sense. So I had my blood tested, but everything was okay. In March, I suddenly got so tired again. I felt like I couldn't get out of bed. I stopped going to the gym, stopped working for my company. I generally did the bare minimum I could. So I'm kind of back at a place where I'm back in bed again and kind of minimal. I could still try but of course I was trying to hide how I was feeling from my daughter like it's not normal for me to be in bed all the time and the last time I was in bed all the time she was that much younger so you know we just snuggle and watch shows all day but I was absolutely miserable so I went to the doctor convinced I was depressed he put me on antidepressants so by about the fourth day I started to feel amazing it was kind of like I was on some other recreational drug because I was out of bed. I was doing all the filing. I, you know, I hadn't been doing, I was making phone calls, answering emails. It was like back in action. As you know, if you do know with the presence, uh, you can get a little bit of a high and then, and then you do plateau. 
and then whatever was there is still there. So I started to kind of level out and not feel as much like, you know, I was on meth, but it was pretty productive for a few days. Um, the extreme high. I think that is like your system adapting to the new, right? And also if you're on too high of a dose, sometimes you get that euphoric high that is also a concern, but obviously with any yes. mental health, talking with people and having those outlets also is where you see that major healing, right? Absolutely. But I was taking Mac everywhere and feeling better than I had in years. So I finally made the choice to get out of my own way and take an antidepressant. And that really did help my, uh, my world. It Absolutely. helped my world. Good functioning. But yeah, but nothing is free. So with antidepressants, their job is to raise your serotonin levels, which is your happiness factor, which is your get up and go, right? So I couldn't sleep but right from the very first day I took the first pill. So, and it would be, if I went to sleep, I was okay, but I had insomnia. So I would thrash it. My body would be, you know, extremely tired, but my brain would be going so then I started to take sleep aids, both over the counter and prescription. And I just figured at that time, it was the price to pay for feeling so good. I hadn't felt that good in years. I was not about to come off that antidepressant for love or money. So if I had to take a 20 milligram dose of melatonin, I was going to do it. I feel like I got a glimpse of my life back. So we're still in 2019. On June 19th, I started experiencing terrifying symptoms. Okay, so I'm going to list these off. I wrote them all down because it's really important that I touch on all of them because depending on which one, it might resonate with one of our listeners. So there was dizziness, fainting, loss of vision, loss of hearing, tingling in my arms, hands, waist, neck, back, legs, feet, head, and face, eye pain, face pain, numb feet, metallic taste in my mouth constantly, night sweats nausea, including vomiting, loss of bowel control, chest pain, exhaustion, which is, we've talked about that up to full days in bed, muscle weakness, extreme hip pain, constipation, diarrhea, headache, slurred speech, confusion, poor memory, clumsiness, and freezing cold hands and feet. When I, on June 19th, I had what I can only describe as a, a stroke-like event. I was walking in to the bathroom and my husband was sitting on the bed and I fell down on the ground and I couldn't see or hear. Uh, and I was just sort of like crouched and writhing around making bizarre noises. Like it was like nothing I've ever experienced before followed by the feeling that I needed to throw up. So I, after I started to get some hearing and vision back, I crawled to the toilet and then laid there for half an hour and then I started getting the, sh the tingling coming down my neck and down my arms and extremities, my limbs. So then I called and they told me I should go to the hospital. And of course I didn't, but I ended up making That's an appointment with a neurologist. Shelby. Terrifying. It, it was absolutely bizarre. And then it kept happening. So then I, I did end up with multiple trips to the ER. I just feel so bad for my husband. My God, could you imagine? I couldn't imagine watching him do that. And he's just trying to hold me. And are you like, are you okay? And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it's scary even remembering it. So I went to the ER multiple times with uh, and chest pain. So I don't know if I listed that one. I got x-rays. I got hooked up to different machines, different doctors, naturopaths, psychologists, chiropractors, physiotherapists, massage therapists. I felt like I was dying. I was certain that I had multiple sclerosis or some other debil debilitating disease uh, that's deteriorating my brain and, and my bodily functions. So I got the urgent visit with a neurologist. He told me I had functional neurological disorder and sent me home with a printout. So in layman's terms, it means that all the symptoms I was feeling were real, but they couldn't link it to any disease. So I'd never been more lost in my life. Mm -hmm. If all the other crap that happened to me this blew it out of the water. I was losing control of my life. I lost control of my health. I had no, I was drowning, I was drowning in everything. So I decided to take another route in September. I went to a naturopath because I felt like the current doctors that I had been seeing had failed me. I knew there was something wrong with me. I'm not crazy. I'm not throwing myself on the ground 
having these experiences. I certainly wasn't losing control of my bowels while I was driving on purpose. I just had to take a different route. You know, you need to advocate for your own health because right now there don't let anyone tell you that there's a test that's going to tell you that it's breast implant illness. So sad that I had to do this for all these years, but we're getting to the finding and the making the connection. So the natural path tested my blood, but you know, if a regular doctor tests your thyroid, your thyroid function and your T4 and T3 function are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So she tested my T3 and T4. She told me they were really low. So I started on thyroid supplements. Okay. So it took about 10 days and I was feeling better again. So then we've got some antidepressants, deal with your mental, right? We've got some thyroid pills to help deal with when you have extremely low thyroid all sorts of crazy scary things can happen it's basically your body shutting down i don't know the science of the thyroid um i can't list it all but the depression the low the tired the sore muscles like so many different things are associated with that so at that I point i was like hypothyroidism Whoa. i i have hypothyroidism right? yeah mm-hmm. okay So basically you feel like you're on your deathbed if it's low. So now I'm like, okay, I got the depression fixed. I got the hypothyroid fixed. Like we're made in the shade. I finally got it figured out. Right. Mm -hmm. But I still wasn't feeling like I should. Okay. So then in January, I was talking to my dear friend, Karen, we grew up together on the sunshine coast. And she told me she was convinced that her breast implants were making her sick and she was having them removed. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And after that conversation, she's crying, I'm crying. And I'm like, this is like the twilight zone. How could my beloved breast implants that cost me thousands of dollars and I understood made me feel great and sexy and all these amazing things could be making me sick for eight years. I was like flabbergasted. I've never... I've never felt so like forced for the trees in my life. After that conversation, I spent nearly every waking hour listening, researching to other people's stories and literally losing my shit. My breast implants had been making me sick for all these years. The connections were absolutely undeniable from the endometriosis to the ovarian cyst, P-O-C-S, polycystic ovarian syndrome, to cystic acne, to just being tired on and on and on, over and over and over and over again, all these stories of these people that now finally, like me, saw the light, the heavens opened up and the light shined down and we finally made the connection between our illnesses and our breast implants. How can it be that the most common cosmetic procedure done in the world could have stolen all those years from my life, stolen my reproductive system, Hour after hour, I read stories from women who had the same or worse symptoms than mine. I just couldn't figure how it could be possible. I was sad and appalled, but you know what? I finally had my answer. Are you correlating the breast implants that actually caused the endometriosis? Or do you think endometriosis was something that you've already always had, but weren't aware of? Or yeah, is there a correlation there? So I'm not a doctor. And this whole breast implant illness topic, you really are on your own in terms of validation. Mm -hmm. And I have read so many stories where people were fine and then suddenly they had endometriosis. So I believe in my heart, which I'm at this point, I don't think a medical professional is going to validate what I'm saying, but I don't need them to. My breast implant illness gave me endometriosis and sent my life in a complete tailspin and dictated the next eight years of my life and my losses and my loss of my loss of control of my health. Absolutely. In my heart, I know that. Yeah. When you have a, so, okay. There's a lot of people that I think there's sort of two streams, but they really are one. The first stream is that breast implants are made of silicone and silicone. Okay. Even if you say, but no minor saline on the inside, the exterior of your breast implant is still made of silicone. So really it's six and one half that those, the silicone is made of all sorts of toxic ingredients, like a laundry list of toxic ingredients. And those toxic ingredients create a horrible environment in your body and 
reacts to those, those ingredients. Makes sense, right? Toxic, le- yeah. leaching into your body. Mm-hmm. But then there's another stream that says, just the fact that a foreign entity is inside your body is enough for your body to wage war on itself. So that's where your autoimmune that's where your thyroid, that's where you're like, essentially your body is waging war on itself because it's trying to rid your body of this entity, but it can't. And then you've got all sorts of hormonal and confusion. And then endometriosis is fueled by estrogen. Me and many, many other sufferers believe that the disease tissue, that disease, the autoimmune, all these things are related to having that foreign entity in your body and having your body waging war on itself. When you break that all down like that, absolutely. Our bodies are amazing at fighting something that it doesn't want there. And so when you break down the estrogen and the endometriosis and everything, that it it does make sense. Yeah disturbing amount of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So So when you were speaking with Karen, did she have a lot of the symptoms that you were experiencing? Is that where your light bulb, like your aha moment went? You're both like, oh, wow. Our commonalities are ridiculously insanely the same. So not as much on the, no endometriosis, but polycystic ovarian syndrome, major depression, exhaustion, thyroid, acne, which is just another way of your body manifesting how angry or how under siege it is, right? It it really can be, or how imbalanced you are on the inside in regards to your hormones. Karen's story is similar to mine in a lot of ways, but it was the other stories and the repeated on and on and on and on of these same symptoms that really was the major like life kind of connection. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a life shattering kind of aha moment in regards to making that connection. Mm-hmm. Cause then you look back and you're like, Oh my God, it took three months. It took three months. I got my breast implants put in the summer. It wasn't even winter. And now, and I have been healthy as a horse my whole life. Nothing wrong with me. My Joe, I wasn't very old, but still now, boom, now the whole course of my life is different. So with the love and support of my gorgeous, amazing, caring husband and my family, I had my breast implants removed February 3rd of 2020. I didn't have much time. It was January to February. My surgeon was incredibly empathetic and was able to sneak me in. But I really, truly believe that I came back to life on that operating table. Wow. How soon after those coming out? Did you feel like your life was coming back to you? The moment I opened my eyes, Uh, the moment I opened my eyes, I felt like a different person. I felt like I had my sparkle back, my mojo, like what's mojo? Like, oh my God, I felt like I get so out of touch with all those Yeah. And all those things that made me kick ass were gone for so long. And instead I was sad and miserable and depressed and kind of avoided most of the things that I used to love. So I had to go to Alberta to do it because I wanted to see my same surgeon. I woke up, we went back to the hospital for an overnight that same night. I'm having a bath. And then I blow dried my hair, which obviously they, you know, they tell you not to do with your arms and, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm your like, chest muscles. Screw that. I, felt, I, felt, yeah, I felt so good. It was ridiculous. Then I'm tidying the room. Tyler's like, maybe you want to sit down. I'm like, don't ever ask me to sit down again. I'm never sitting down again. So I just buzzed around. I stopped taking my I stopped taking, they give you painkillers, of course, it's a surgery. So I stopped taking those on the third day, stopped taking Tylenol by the fourth day. My drains, it took about two weeks for my drains. They, it's surgeon specific, but I, I had drains, which is to help release the extra fluid, right? Your body sends fluid to a place it's healing mm-hmm. so that you don't get extra fluid buildup. So it took me about two weeks to have those come out, but I'd be like, they're like, oh yeah, you're really supposed to relax. I'm like, vacuuming because I felt so good I was like I've been chained to my bed for years like I want to like I 
went around and cleaned every, I have wainscoting in every room of my house. I went around and cleaned every piece of wainscoting, every little nook and cranny, which I got to say, they were pretty freaking gross because <laughs> I was not, none of that stuff mattered. I wasn't motivated. I didn't have extra energy to do any of that. You were making up for uh, all those eight well, years I, after surgery. Yeah, okay, it wasn't days. eight years of dust. <laughs> Let me clarify, but it certainly was a couple solid months of me not dunging out, you know, but doing that really tight. It was thing. eight years of you not feeling like you, and you knew that oh. that minute was you were back. Yes. Yes, it was. It was back. And it was like, it was like somebody just sort of operating on level two. And then suddenly I'm like, I don't know, like ACDC back in black is playing and I'm full of piss and vinegar again. That's literally what it felt like. Oh my gosh. It it was like, I was the star of my own show. It was bizarre. Bizarre is the only way I can say it. And like, it was a hail Mary. Nobody, like I, I didn't get validated that, 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 that I went for surgery and it was going to make me feel better. There was no, it was really just me and what I believed in my heart to be true. And then at that point I was like, literally, what do I have to lose? Mm-hmm. What do I have to lose? It can't get any worse than the situation that I'm currently living in, in regards to my health. So, you know, did your surgeon, have they said like, they've seen an increase in this? Does he do many removal surgeries? Like, what does that look like? So I think this is a different, this is sort of a difficult topic because in regards to breast implants, they've been around for a gazillion years. There's been a million tests by the FDA and health, whoever, that all said that they they are okay, right? For a lot of years that they're not going to hurt you. So then doctors go off all those that testing and all those documents that come out and they say, well, no, I based it off my documents and, and you know, people are fine. But now there's new research coming in starting to say, and like, I don't know how like official these documents are, like history is not being rewritten right now, but that's also, what do you do when you're a surgeon and that's what you do for a living? Do you validate the fact that what you do for a living is making people sick or like, okay, there's one gentleman in Beverly Hills and he's decided to go, he's decided to go the full on. I recognize it. He was on doc the doctor's TV show. I can't remember what it was. Validated. Agree with it. 80%, 80 to 90% of my patients after explant feel better or a reduction in some symptoms that they've been. So he's decided to go that way. Wonderful, but also monetizing on those explant costs. And then I think you have most of the surgeons that are sort of on the fence and don't really want to delegitimize it, but don't really want to legitimize it either because well, because I guess they're industry. still in market. It's yeah, industry. exactly. They're still in market for implants. And if it doesn't hurt everyone, then they can still sell it to those people. But how common is breast implant illness? Well, I found a lot of my information from Facebook groups and then there's resource websites and it's they're disturbing amount, disturbing amount disturbing amount of women that are sick and many, many, I'm sure that are sick and haven't made the connection yet. So like my best friend, we had our breast implants, our first set put in in the exact same year, the exact same textured breast implants. She never had a problem with them. She now has the second set. They're beautiful and amazing. And she feels as right as rain. So as much as I want to say there's tons of people, there certainly is tons of people that are sick, but there are a ton of people that are not. And I think that it just depends on how sensitive, say, your body is to a foreign object. It doesn't send everyone reeling a lot less. Like I have, which I think, and with doing my reading, I have a pretty severe case. I had a lot of bad things happen in my health. Then there's some other people that could maybe get the odd cyst and really bad acne. And and then they may take a thyroid pill and it would regulate. And then they continue on and and maybe never make the association or it was never bad enough to delve in any deeper. So the the scale really is all over the place for the symptoms and the experiences that people have. And that's why it's so hard to, they say, 
prove, pin down, I guess, the research to back up the claims that these that women like myself have in regards to the connection. But this is the deal. No one is going to validate you. I think at this point, the medical system has failed us. I know that there's a lot of people advocating. There's a lot of people trying to get the word out and to get more tests done and to get these women and question them, try to make connections. And I know those things are happening. This is a Hail Mary. I didn't have time to wait even another day to then have them say, oh, breast implants are making people sick. We'll explant and pay for it. Like the recall they finally figured out on, on the textured implant. I didn't have time to give up a single second more of my life. So I hail married it. We made the choice. We removed them, and and you're never. You know, sometimes I even get I, I even get caught up with my own words because I can't describe the change between who I was when I had them and the person that I feel like I am now. So the reason why I'm telling this story and sharing this is because. When I read further and further into breast implant illness, I find that there are so many women that are suffering. If you're sick and suspect that your implants are making you ill, I'd urge you to do your research, join Facebook groups, talk to me, write me an email. I'm going to give you some more resources um, at the end of this. It is real. You are not crazy. This is not in your head. You don't feel like crap and spend days in bed and have stroke-like events and lose control of your own bowels because you're a healthy 30-something-year-old woman. Like That doesn't make sense. Doctors may not agree with you that it's your implants. They may put you on antidepressants. They may put you on thyroid pills. They may, you know, try to kind of patch these other things. But like in my case, I truly believe the root causes my breast implants that then kind of did a domino effect to the rest of the functionality in my body. The choice to remove your implants will likely need to be on faith, trusting your gut and what you believe in in your heart of hearts. If you read all these stories in your light, light bulb and I can't even function a single more day because the truth is so there for me, then you just have to do it. Absolutely. Follow your gut, trust um, your gut. And I really needed to say goodbye to my breast, breast implants um, and the body image issues and all these things that are tied into plastic surgery and, and augmenting your body. But I had to do it in order to get my life back. And I think that, you know, we, there's so many societal influences and pressures to look a certain way and have a perfect round butt and you need to have big boobs and you need to have a tiny waist. And I just feel like you need to consider, for anyone that's thinking about breast implants, Number one, perfection is unattainable. Trust me, look for it. It's unattainable and it's it's actually ugly. The search for it is never ending and never satisfying. There is certainly the pursuit of excellence. I absolutely believe in the pursuit of excellence and self-care and taking care of yourself and going to the gym and looking in the mirror and feeling proud of yourself for the work that you've done with diet and, and taking care of yourself. But I would just question you and our listeners, what would you sacrifice for perfect breasts? Because if I had to go back, I wouldn't sacrifice a single thing that I ended up in turn having to trade in for these perfect breasts. So oh, well said shelves. That's so, so powerful. Yeah, it is, you know, and not everyone's going to get as sick as I did, but it is a, it was a wild, terrible time. And I'm happy that it's in my rear view. And you know what? I am more of a woman now with my scarred up, saggy, tiny breasts than I ever was with 32 double Ds. So honestly, it's, it's like, get out of the way because I'm back. <laughs> So you are now a part of an advocacy group for BII. So tell us a little bit about this group. 
So I documented my journey. Uh, thankfully, I had enough foresight at the time when I was still sick to document. So I made a series of videos on my YouTube channel um, from my initial one a few days before I went in to have them removed and the emotions that are tied into that. And then kind of all the way along, like, oh, I'm going to get my drains out, taken out, and this is how I feel. And, you know, and then I'm going to do a one year follow up in February uh, and let everybody know, you know, kind of what it feels like a year later on the other side. So that can be found on my YouTube channel. And I think it's a great resource for anyone. Um, I, I do. I delve into the same sort of things that we talked about here today. And I share blips of that um, throughout my Instagram feed. Amanda and Jen, they're founders of this thing, this beautiful thing called Explant Liaison. They reached out to me. They're from the United States. They reached out to me and said, hey, we heard about your story, blah, blah, blah. Would you be liaison for Canada. And I said that I would be honored and please give them my email, you know, give them my personal information because I'd be happy to discuss with anyone that currently has implants or, or is thinking about getting them or, you know, is lost in any way in regards to your health. We were, okay, so we're geared up. And so they started their Instagram page. They grew up from zero. They're now at around 4,900 followers, which I'm really proud of them for that. And they also just got in 2020, their website going, which is an incredible resource. Um, so many women's stories. You can find my story and many others on there as well. So both the website and their Instagram page is of the same name. It's called Explant Liaison, and that's E-X-P-L-A-N-T-L-I-A-I-S-O-N. I wanted to tell you too, both Amanda and Jen are sufferers of breast implant illness, and they decided that if we all sit back and be quiet, nothing changes. And that's why you know, we're kind of a, we're like a merry band of brothers all kind of linking arms together to try and communicate resources and information for people that to get them to look at their timeline and think about, holy shit, may there be a link between when I had them put in and my now health issues. So really inspiring women and I, I'm really proud to be able to be part of anything that they're doing and, and to be able to be a resource if anyone has any questions or just wants to bounce anything off me or just hear themselves say it out loud because honestly it's, it's pretty powerful hearing yourself say it out loud if you've made a connection between your health issues and your breast implants absolutely absolutely i think that the more like anything the more that people talk about things the more that other people don't feel so alone and don't feel so crazy and what's wrong with me that there are reasons for things if only we are able to voice them and not be felt as not put in the corner you know not not felt so alone make sure that everyone knows that these are the symptoms and side effects you experienced someone else might have something different but because of everything that you have listed today, those people that may have may be experiencing some of those symptoms and side effects will take a, sep a second look at themselves and dig a little bit deeper. Yeah, and it's a women's issue, right? So women's issue is taboo. A women's issue is something that we don't talk about. We don't talk about our breasts. We don't talk about our vagina. So I'd like to break those barriers. And I'd like to assist to break those barriers. And I, I'd, I'd like to see down the road that we can give some more support to women that are suffering with multiple different types of issues from mental to physical, thyroid, autoimmune, neurological, all the things that that we need support. We need support. I want to tell you that I am now just shy of a year since I removed my breast implants. And I don't want you to think that, okay, I removed my breast implants and I feel like a different person. There is no denying that. That is not a stretch by any means. But I think it's important that people know that it may not be a cure all for the things that are going on inside your body. Now, I still take prescription sleeping pills. I'm still on antidepressants and I'm still on thyroid medication. Okay. I would like to think, and I, and I believe that once your body detox and heals, your body's an amazing machine down the road, maybe we can reassess it coming off those things and, and see if my body has improved from not having them in my body. 
but it's just the day to day that has improved. And I am so grateful for that, that I'll take a little bit of insomnia. I'll take a little bit of depression and, you know, I'll take some thyroid supplements because I've never, I literally haven't felt this good since I was next to a child, a teenager. So it may not be a cure-all. It may be, maybe down the road, my body will heal itself enough that I don't have to take to lean on these medications. But for now I do. And I'm okay with that because I just, well, and as you said, you're just shy of a year right now. You have, your body is healing itself from that toxic exposure for all of those years. You can only do one thing at a time to be able to allow it to recover properly. You don't want to come off of everything and shock it to a whole different level. Allow your body to heal and listen, as you have said, to your gut and make those other changes as you need or want or can in the future, not right now as you're recovering from this huge explant surgery. Absolutely. And I think naturally we, we want to be like, okay, they're removed. So I'm perfectly fine. I'm healed now. I've removed, you know, the, the stress or the trigger. So now I'm going to be better, but you know, it truly doesn't work that way. And there's a lot of functionalities that are being affected by my breast implants and, and just the fact that they were in my body. So I think we just need to give ourselves a breather, give your body the time that it takes to heal, give your mind the time that it takes to heal. And there's so many different other things going on in our life and, and traumas and the things we carry around. And those are not easy fixes. Those are not immediate fixes. You don't just flip the switch and those things are gone. So I think it's a constant process of letting go, and moving forward, a constant process of accepting and living for the now. I'd like to think that maybe I don't need these things, but maybe I do. And, and that's okay. That's okay too. Because I think that if you need help, you need to, you need to use it. You need to get it. And there's, we have in our world, we have these things to help us and to feel better in all elements, but by removing that one thing that was clearly not doing that for you is the start of your new life. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Today's conversation with Shelby left me speechless. All of her raw openness, everything that she has experienced through the last eight years of her life. I hope that listening in today brought some of you that may be experiencing some of those symptoms a little bit of peace of mind that you're not alone. I will link all the information today in the show notes and feel free to reach out to Shelby anytime on Instagram. You can find her at it's the Shelb life. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it. See you next week. You can find me on Instagram at mom's wet family.